in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Hello, story seekers. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. We had tremendous bloody fun on our journey through season three with you. All good things apparently must come to an end, though, so we've put together two roundups to celebrate our guests. First up, we were joined by Nebula nominated Dr. Charles E. Gannon, who excels in epic fantasy, techno thrillers, and hard sci fi. He reads an excerpt from chapter 24 of book two of his Kane Riordan series, which gave us the prompt. Problem solved. Kane leaned the fragment of mirror around the dangling remains of the window frame, resolved to get a better look. The Aratkur ROV was a ground pounder. It was far too heavy to go airborne and improperly shaped to have a live operator inside. Its narrowest point was much thinner than an Aratkur was wide. Is it a robot? asked Tega. No, I think it's an ROV with an expert backup system. Expert system, echoed one of the younger Indonesians, whose long mellifluous name Kane had learned and promptly forgotten three times now. Yeah, answered Kane, watching the slow, cautious advance of the Aratkur unit, its two micro turrets rotating protectively through rear and flank covering arcs. Reporters like to call ground drones like this AIs, but there's no intelligence involved, just very sophisticated algorithms. They can operate independently for a short bit of time. Huh, not a tigger. Yeah, I can believe that. Why? Kane asked. Well, these uh, expert systems don't like to go into stone or concrete buildings. They won't chase anyone inside, which makes sense. Kane smiled at Tega. You're right. Stone and other dense construction materials block signals. The machine shouldn't stay where it has to rely upon its own expert system. Tega shrugged. Sounds like a weakness to me. Kane smiled. Me too. Let's go. I may have a plan. You sure this is a good idea, man? Kane wanted to answer, hell no, but instead said, I'm pretty sure it'll work, as long as you're certain these expert systems don't shoot at unarmed humans. Haven't seen them do it yet, and they've had plenty of opportunity since this afternoon. And you're sure they have a capture mode? Yeah, like I told you, we've seen these robo-roaches come into areas where rebels or rioters have been making trouble. They find some older kids, do a spider sprint, and grab them. Then they carry them back to the roach motel. The what? The aliens compound. They took over the presidential palace. So the roaches ask the kids questions, shoot about anyone they know who might be a rebel. Always with an officer from the army standing there, Pega spat. But then they let him go. Scares the shit out of the kids, but they've never been hurt. Well, that's reassuring, sort of. Okay, then. Are your people ready? Good air. Question is, are you ready? Again, hell no. Yeah, here goes. Kane ducked low and scooted out under the level of the cars parked along the street. He peeked out at the Arakur ROV. It was still a creeping forward, aware that its prey, Tega's trapped friends, had moved farther down the dead-end street and were now unable to escape. But precisely where was that prey hiding? Well, here's something new to think about. Kane rose slowly from his hiding place. He walked, hands open, closer to the Arakur ROV, but also angled toward the looted and gutted stone bank Across the street. The Aratkur unit's rear sensors detected him immediately. One of the mini turrets fixed upon him, the other began sweeping the unit's rear, laboring to keep nearby upper stories and rooftops in its defensive footprint. Come on, call your boss and find out what to do and who I am. The Aratkur unit was utterly motionless for two seconds, and then, so suddenly that Kane's stomach clenched and plummeted, the multi legged device whirled about and came at him with startling speed. Kane had been expecting the charge but still felt terribly slow as he turned and sprinted into the bank, sure that, at any second, he would feel the Arakur equivalent of a taser probe dig into his back and sprawl him, twitching, across the debris-littered sidewalk. But he made it through the doors into the bank and heard, just behind, the clatter of the ROV's legs break stride. Kane didn't stop. The unit's apparent indecision was merely a split-second pause as it awaited the overrider signal. Only its live operator could authorize it to enter the structure. Kane, now in the hall leading into the bank's interior offices, was glad he hadn't broken his own stride. He heard the ROV resume its skittering approach, the bank's broken picture windows scraping and screeching as the spider-like legs smashed and dashed them aside in its crazed pursuit. 
Riordan reached the yawning freight elevator shaft at the end of the hall, grabbed the knotted rope that was hanging there, heard the ROV right behind him. He turned, saw the taser dart dispenser on the front of the robotic arthropod snap open. Just as three of Tego's young Anesians, waiting two stories overhead, dropped a small jury-rigged counterweight. Kane, clutching the counterweighted rope, blinked at the rapidity of his upward acceleration and was both terrified and gratified to see the mechanical spider leap into the open shaft beneath him. Slowly but steadily, it began ascending, its legs spanning from wall to wall. As soon as the three young Indonesians grabbed Kane off the ascending rope, he nodded to a fourth, slightly older one. That fellow was waiting with bolt cutters poised upon the elevator's own counterweight cable, and at Kane's nod, he closed the cutters with a snap. The steel ring that cinched the upper part of the elevator's main cable to the lower half squealed and sparked as the bolt cutter sheared through it. Released from the counterweight in the basement, the car of the freight elevator, waiting two stories farther up, began rushing down. The mechanical spider paused, sensors rotating upward to investigate the new sound. Right as the car crashed into it, and powered the flailing unit all the way down to the bottom of the lightless shaft. Their joint plummet ended with a smashing sound akin to a head-on collision of dump trucks. Next up, we have the incredibly prolific Simon Bestwick. Simon, whose most recent novella is called A Different Kind of Light, wrote to the prompt Beneath the Crust. Beneath the Crust I abandoned the car on the moors and spend a few minutes looking down at the blackened stain where the city was. Here and there, it's still smoking. From the centre of the blackened zone, a great thick column of steam and smoke twists upwards, reaching into the sky before crumbling away into the wind. There are still checkpoints around the perimeter, but it's easy to find a weak point. It's been a month. Everyone's accepted nothing here can be alive, that their loved ones are lost and burned away. Everyone, it seems, but me. I slip through a checkpoint while the guard's looking the other way, then break into a run. The blackened zone smells of ash and tar and burning things. A prickly, sticky heat still hovers in the air. And above all, there's the crust. The black, brittle crust that covers everything. My footsteps in it sound like teeth biting into ripe apples. I duck around the nearest corner. No one shouts. No one fires at me. I'm inside the blackened zone. I'm in the place you died. It gets easier now. A month on, they're still arguing about what happened. They call it a seismic event, as if that meant anything. In a country that hasn't seen an active volcano in 50 million years, something burst through the Earth's crust in the city centre and nobody knows why. Broke one crust, and created another. There was something different about the tephra from this eruption, some tarry, sticky quality about the ash that meant it adhered to any surface it touched, covered it, and hardened. The lamp posts looked like columns of charcoal, the streets are narrow plains of brittle black, the cars are caked in it, the people inside them too. I try not to look at them. But there's no avoiding the pedestrians. Some lie on the ground, but most didn't get the chance. I'm prepared for it, to an extent, having seen the footage from the news drones that flew in the blackened zone for a few minutes before seizing up and dying. I see a couple of fallen drones as I make my way down the street. They're the only things not caked in ash. Most of the dead look as though they were turned to stone, or charcoal anyway. But not at once. The carapace of ash is thick enough to hold them in their last position, but can't erase all features. Enough details visible for me to wish it wasn't. Hands clawing at the air, arched backs, ash-clogged mouths open wide in screams. Did you die like that? I want to believe you didn't suffer, but there's no reassurance here. Up ahead, the grey, twisted column still rises from the eruption site. No one's been able to get close enough to analyse it. Someone else can solve that mystery. That isn't why I'm here. I don't care why this happened, only that it did. No, there are only two places I need to go, and only that many, because I didn't pay attention. I was out of the city. 
a training course in a town a hundred miles to the southwest, boring beyond words. I hadn't wanted to go, but hadn't been able to get out of it. You joked about pulling a sickie. I was tempted, but didn't. If I had, I'd be dead too. I probably will be by the end of today. It doesn't matter. We talked on my mobile, hands-free, as I drove down the motorway, trying and failing to avoid the rush-hour traffic. I was distracted, only half listening. My last conversation with you. And I can't remember now whether you were working from home that day or going into the office, so I'll need to visit both. The office first. If you're there, I'll carry you home. And then? Doesn't matter. Nothing after that does. Chances are I haven't long anyway. Even with a scarf wrapped around my face, each breath still makes my throat and lungs burn. An encrusted corpse wedges the main door open. I mutter a thank you as I step over it. For all I know, that was you. You have to look closely to even guess the sex of the dead. But I don't think it was. Against all logic, I'm certain I'll know when I found you. For the first few days I used to dream you'd survived, that if I could win my way through the barriers you'd be there, scared, shaking, but alive. I know better now. The best I can hope is to die beside you, as I should have done that day. People talk about healing, closure, moving on. Good for them, if they can. I can't. You truly were my other half. What's left with you gone was never going to last long. I crunched my way through the lobby into your department. Death here was instant. The corpses are frozen in ordinary, workaday gestures, showing no sign of pain or alarm. Only those at the very back of the office are contorted as though they suffered. Your desk was at the back of the office. My eyes stream, and my breathing's ragged, and not from the smoke. I'm afraid what I'll see but your desk's empty. There's just your keyboard and monitor, a coffee mug and a framed photograph, both fused to the desktop by a coating of black cinders. I break the crust away from the picture. The heat's faded, but I can still see us both. We were camping up on the coast. We were happy that day. You could still be here, of course. You could have got up to go to the toilet or talk to a colleague. But I don't believe you are. And that's better. It's better if you were home, our home, when you died. I put the photograph in my pocket. And I hear the cracking of ash. It gets louder. Not one sound, but several. Then a dozen. More. For a moment I think the whole crust of ash clinging to the ceilings and walls is about to fall on me and end things here and now. But when I turn around, I see that it's coming from the frozen shapes around me, from the joints of their limbs, their necks, as they begin to move. Encrusted heads turn towards me, limbs raised to ward off final agonies, are lowered, ready to lunge and grab. Arched spines straighten, shards of ash fall to the floor. Their movements are slow, painful and arthritic, but there are so many of them between me and the entrance. The nearest one steps towards me. More of its blackened shell cracks and falls away. Something glistens underneath. What will I see when it's all gone? Are the dead rising in anger at their vast city-sized tomb being disturbed? Or are they dead at all? Is the crust, in fact, a chrysalis and something horribly different about to emerge? Then I remember there's a fire exit near your desk. I hoped you'd escaped through it before I remembered that even if you had, there'd only be more clouds of scalding dust outside. But it's just past your desk, and then a short run to my left. The nearest figure reaches for me, hand shedding flakes of ash. It looks like a claw. I hit the fire door shoulder first, and it bursts open. I blunder through shin-deep cinders, trip and go sprawling in them. Jagged pieces prick my hands. I get up. Inside the office, they're all moving now. Slowly, stiffly, but with purpose. I run.
all the dead city stirs around me, awakening to the intruder. Slow or not, they are many. I know I'll never leave the blackened zone. But I never intended to, and I only have one place left now to go. We didn't live far from your office. I'm gladder of that now that you're dead than I ever was when you were alive. A row of little terraced houses, a railway embankment at one end. At night we used to lie in bed listening to the trains rattle in the dark. Never too loud, just a gentle rumble that helped us sleep. I almost stumble past our door. The house is so caked in ash it's unrecognisable. Looking back along the street for those slow, relentless pursuers, I break chunks of ash away from the lock and fumble for my keys, praying the mechanism isn't clogged or fused. But the key turns, click, and the only struggles forcing the door in, breaking the seal of ash that holds it shut. Inside it's dark, the air thick, staler, and more scorching than outside. I shut and lock the door anyway. Asphyxiation's probably the best death I could hope for, and this was always where my journey was going to end. I find you at the kitchen table, your laptop in front of you, fingers poised above the keys. The back door's open. It was a bright, hot day, and you were proud of your garden, though now it's a blackened waste. The surge of ash must have filled the house in seconds. You wouldn't have suffered. There one instant, gone the next. Or, depending what the ash did, on what you'd become. Maybe not gone. At all. I kept hold of the photo of us. I put it down beside you, lean back in my chair and close my eyes. From across the table comes a cracking sound. I suppose it's too late to become like you, but I can always hope. I can hear you stirring, hear your blackened shell begin to fall away. Another minute, and I'll open my eyes and see for myself what's beneath the crust. Joining us next, we had R.J. Barker, author of the critically acclaimed Tide Child trilogy, all three of which are out now, by the way. He's reading an excellent short story from which we drew the prompt, Yorkshire. The Shepherd. One. Lift. I used to hear foxes screaming and dream it was people. Now I hear people and wish it was foxes. Only occasionally now, mind. The scream still drift across the heather-carpeted moors and into my hayloft prison, carried here on freakish warm winds. The first time I ever heard cries for help, it had me pacing up and down the barn loft, desperate to do something, hobnail boots drumming out my impotence on the wooden floor. Pacing doesn't feel safe now. This old building creaks like a ship under sail. I have one shotgun cartridge. My world is green and purple, brown and white and red. Yan, Tam and Tethera rule here. Two, fetch. Yan is eight, pure breed border collie and the best sheepdog I ever had. Tam is ten, Yan's mother and always the calmest of the three. Tethera is one and a half and only just out of puppyhood. He's rotting away the fastest. I don't know why. Tam sits well back, ready to return any of the flock that try and make a break. Tetherer runs tireless circles around the herd, his legs trailing strips of filthy skin and fur. But it's always Yan that drives them forward. He sits, stares up at me from empty eye sockets, does it for hours on end. Then... When he can bear it no more, he hunkers down his forequarters, raises his tailless rump into the air and he starts the drive, frightening the flock, pushing them against the barn. It moans under the stress of so many bodies. Sour rotten, the stink of sheep fills the air. The dogs never kill members of the flock, but they won't let them rest or eat either. A ewe burst from the pressure of a thousand of its fellows once. Spraying red over the dirty white balling mass around it. They never bark, the dogs. I'm so hungry. I used to love lamb. Three. Drive. My, my legs won't work. 
I, I could bear it no longer, tried to end it. <laughs> the shotgun misfired, burning and bruising my face, but doing no else. I fell back from the blast, did something to my neck. Everything hurts now and I can barely move. In last night's rain and wind, something went, something structural in me and in this place. The whole barn healed over by 45 degrees. Cold water poured in through the roof as if I didn't know enough misery. The dogs can almost jump into the hayloft. Every so often, Tetherer makes an attempt to get in and I have to fend scuttering claws away from the hatchway in the floor with the shotgun, but the weapon's useless for anything else. But so am I. Tam sits patiently at the edge of the flock. Her tongue lolls from her mouth, lifeless and dead without her animating pant. And the pressure of the flock forces rhythmic, groaning breaths from the old building's timbers. A splinter as long as my arm vibrates at stomach height. The only sharp thing I can reach. I'm not scared of dying. Just the pain. Jan hunkers down his forequarters, raises his tailless rump into the air and starts to drive, frightening the flock, pushing them against the healing barn. With a whip crack report, another support gives way and the barn moves another inch lower. Jan's sightless eye sockets stare up at me as a sea of sheep wash up against the building, waves of panicked flesh and wool. Not long now, lad, I tell him. Not long now. Best sheepdog I ever had. Nina Allen was our next guest. The Guardian named her as one of the 50 authors who you should read right now. Well, maybe after you finish listening. Nina gave us the prompt, Empty Tank. Empty Tank. The target was immaterial. So long as the organisms were released within the 10-day period and under conditions that would be conducive to their survival, Church would get his payout. The nymphs can stay alive pretty much anywhere, Baggett had said, but in order for them to multiply, they need access to water. They like a moist, humid atmosphere. A bathroom is ideal. The Kreef were a semi-aquatic life form, she explained. Even a small number of individuals would spread rapidly through the underground sewage system. The entire northern quarter of the city will be seeded in less than a year, Baggett said. If you do your job properly, that is, which I know you will. She had barely glanced at him as she said this, her eyes directed instead towards her screen as she tapped and scrolled tapped and scrolled. Where are you from? Church had asked her at their second meeting, the crucial one, the one where terms had been agreed. Shown him the proof he had asked for. The encrypted file had arrived in his inbox shortly after midnight the day before. Transcripts of calls he had made, names he had leaked. Not just enough to ruin him, enough to put him on trial for treason, since treason had once again become a capital crime, a change in the law that he, Church, had argued for, had voted for, had, according to some, made the central platform of his return to politics, there would be those who, if they knew of his situation, might laugh behind their hands, murmur how he was rightly hoist by his own petard. Sven Kamerud, for example, would have a field day, though with a hack like Kamerud, it was more a question of professional one-upmanship than personal animosity. Louise, though, Louise was a different matter. The way she had betrayed him still made Church feel ill, even a year on. Not just the fact of it, but the shock, the moment of realisation, the long, tawdry aftermath. His climb back had been painful. There had been many moments when Church had asked himself if it was worth it whether any of it was worth it. Burn out. He could almost hear her whisper it. Church wondered if it had been Louise who had passed the information to Jocelyn Baggett, if she was responsible for this new nightmare as well as the old one. Baggett had refused to name her source, but 
You do understand, Bagot was saying. Oh, of course, Church said, coming back to himself with a bump. He had no idea what he had just agreed to, what he was meant to understand or not. Jocelyn Bagot was not the kind of woman you could safely ask to repeat a question. Church found himself wondering again if she was infected herself, if she was no longer human. Those eyes of hers, the queasy blackness of them, the near invisible boundary between iris and pupil. She was beautiful, he supposed, in a way. If you could somehow separate that from what she was, from what she was planning, which, of course, you could not. Church coughed. When do I, uh, how should I, uh, take delivery? Bagot smiled, her lips compressed together in a hard line. Oh, you can leave that to us. That evening, Church got drunk, and as he poured himself his fourth, or was it fifth, glass of Rioja, he asked himself if he even believed, if the whole thing wasn't bullshit, and if so, what was he mixed up in really? What was their game? The Kreef, Bagot had told him, were an alien entity. No, no, not alien, he corrected himself, an alternate world entity that had once been present in our world, that were its rightful rulers. What we're doing, Bagot had said, is restoring the natural order of things. No more, no less. You remember those campaigns that were popular a couple of decades ago to reintroduce lynx and wolves to the Scottish Highlands? They failed, Church mumbled. Oh, well, yes, well, the wolves clearly didn't have the right kind of help. Help like you, she said, and there was something in the way she looked at him an absence of compassion so total and so conscious that struck Church as beyond evil. The cold equations, he thought, the currency of hell. Because hell, if it existed, would be like this. No cackling, no gloating, no stupid jokes about the exorcist. Just an overwhelming knowledge of the end. A bottomless blackness, like everything's shut down forever and no fucks given. Church shook himself. The bottle was empty. No wonder he was tail spinning. He went to bed, making a point of cleaning his teeth and setting the alarm. When shortly after breakfast the following morning the tank was delivered, he felt strong enough and angry enough to convince himself the whole thing, the whole charade, was a joke at his expense. Or if not a joke exactly, those files were real after all, then an attempt to push him out, to make him go quietly, a mundane political threat. Something Louise had dreamed up most likely. If he took the trouble to look into Jocelyn Baggett's background, and he would, he promised himself, he would, he would no doubt discover she had been working for Louise Michener all along. Church cursed himself inwardly for not realising it sooner. Someone was taking the piss. Time to get real. The tank was lined with gravel, and on top of the gravel, some greenish-brown fuzzy growth that looked like moss. Amongst the moss were some medium-sized pebbles. At first glance, the tank seemed empty of life, though as Church stared at the moss and the pebbles, he began to see it was not. Five, ten, a dozen things skittered and flurried and floated about the mossy hollows and micro-boulders of their artificial universe. If Church had been forced to describe them, he would have said they were like transparent woodlice. Transparent woodlice only five times the size of an ordinary woodlouse with long articulated legs and thread-like antennae. They could run like buggery, he saw as he watched them, fascinated in spite of himself. They could squeeze themselves flat as a coin, slide under one of those pebbles like a piece of junk mail under a doormat. Freaky. The idea of touching them was horrifying, though bugs and spiders didn't normally bother him. He would have to, though. He couldn't very well transport them into someone's bathroom in the goddamn fish tank. Jocelyn Baggett, typically had brushed this practicality aside as of no account. Oh, it's quite easy, she said. The night before release, you place the tank in a cold place, a chest freezer or an unheated outbuilding. Low temperatures make them inactive. You can transfer them from the tank to a smaller container by hand. It's quite safe, she added, 
for you and for them, safe and simple. Safe and simple, my arse. That evening, Church got drunk again. He rehearsed his plan in his head, learning its details by heart so they seemed preordained. He was going to call Louise. This had been his intention from the start. He realised that now, from the moment Jocelyn Baggett had sent him the file, and ask her for a reconciliation. He would tell her things, things he hadn't said to her in years. He might even cry a little. Louise would take the bait then, for sure. She would invite him round to talk things through. They had always been good together. In bed, that was. In his own subtle way, church would remind her of that. He imagined her bathroom, the sunken tub with its lapis tiles, the lavender-scented towels, the sauna. Moist, Baggett had said, moist and humid, with access to water. The slow, inexorable takeover of one organism by another, Baggett had also said. Have you heard of the ignimon wasp, the cordyceps fungus? Once a person is infected, in every way that matters, they are already creef. Where one door closes, another opens. Do you see? Louise had treated him like an insect. Fair exchange was no robbery, Church thought. Just deserts. It had to be soon, though. The ten days Baggett had given him were ebbing away. Tonight, he decided, the creef would go into the freezer tonight. Then he would call Louise. The tank seemed much as usual, and as he reached up to lift it from the top of the filing cabinet in his office, Church barely glanced inside. Glancing inside made him nervous, though it was Baggett and her ultimatum that really made him nervous, he told himself. The moss, the pebbles, the darting transparent wood lice. He had seen those so many times now, they were becoming boring. He carried the tank carefully downstairs, placing it briefly on the floor as he unlocked and opened the door that led into the garage. It was only once he was actually in there that he noticed. The tank's lid had become dislodged, and the tank was empty. Not apparently empty, the way Church was used to, but empty. Had he unseated the lid himself, carrying it, or had it been like that for a while and he hadn't noticed? Church found he couldn't say. The blood beat in his ears. It occurred to him that he might justifiably call Baggett, claim his payout, although money now seemed the least of his concerns. To round off part one of this roundup, we have Stu from the Stu World Order podcast whose knowledge of comic books and movies is phenomenal. Stu wrote to the prompt, Interference. Interference. Patrick was not sure that he would ever get used to having traded in pads for khakis and a button-down shirt. He wasn't sure standing behind a podium would ever feel as comfortable as standing in front of a net. Could facing down 80 mile per hour slap shots really compare to a hundred eyes on him, all focused on every word he said? At least back on the ice, he had five men standing with him, protecting him as best they could. Now, it was just Patrick. It probably wasn't a good idea to think of the people he'd be talking to so frequently as the opposition, he thought as he straightened his blue and yellow striped tie, a reminder of the colors he wore in college. Those folks weren't taking shots at him after all. They were depending on him. That was different. In that regard, they were more like his old teammates, right? Right? Patrick slowed his breathing and looked towards the curtain. As he stared at it, he felt his breathing start to hurry again, seemingly of its own accord. He looked at the clock. He only had a few minutes left to wait. Was he sweating through his shirt already? The thought made him miss the cold of the ice. Two years ago, he never would have been here. Two years ago, he was skating in the Frozen Four, one game away from taking his school to the national championship. Two years ago, he was a senior in college, playing before professional scouts and hoping to make an impression. Two years ago, he was letting over a decade of early morning practices and missed school dances take him to his destiny. 
and two years ago, it was taken away. Back then, the semifinal of the NCAA tournament was tied at three in its second overtime. Patrick had stopped 42 shots to that point and was determined to stop everything he faced until his team could solve the opposing Wisconsin goalie. However long that took, he was going to keep his team in the game. As the Badgers circled him on their power play, Patrick never let the puck leave his sight. He saw the pass back to the point perfectly. He shifted his weight as the defenseman wound up his shot. But then it all went black. The Badgers' right wing, a sophomore named Stottlemyre, had run into Patrick. No, he didn't just run into him. He powered all the way through him. Patrick still wasn't sure exactly when he was knocked out. Was it when the back of his head hit the crossbar and popped his mask off? Or was it immediately after when he fell and hit the ice? It didn't really matter, ultimately. He had given up the game-winning goal and suffered his fifth concussion since starting college. It was goaltender interference. There's just no way it wasn't. In the weeks after the game, while Patrick recovered in a dark room, he watched the replay obsessively. And bitterly. Stottlemyre took a minor jostle from Patrick's defenseman, and he used it as an excuse to careen into the goalie. The referee had thought Patrick's teammate initiated the contact and swallowed his whistle, but Patrick knew that was the wrong call. He watched it over and over. Stottlemyre had intentionally rushed him to cause the goal. Losing the game stung. Well, no, that's not right. Losing the game downright blew. But the constant medical advice he had received in the loss's wake was somehow worse. Doctor after doctor confirmed that Patrick had to hang up his skates. The concussions had simply become too numerous over too short a period of time. Continuing to play at all was far too risky. Turning pro was simply out of the question. He remembered talking to his pastor in the weeks after his graduation, hoping to find some kind of solace. Well, Pastor William did the talking. Patrick mostly sat there and found that he didn't want to listen after all. He knew what it was all going to be. This happened for a reason, and trust in the plan. These were great platitudes for losing a game and still looking forward, but for having all of his future games taken away from him? Nice sayings simply weren't helping, even from the man Patrick always thought of as another grandfather. Still, Pastor William never gave up on Patrick. He texted every day with new opportunities, as he called them. Come to the church and help out. Talk to the kids at the vacation Bible school. Work in the soup kitchen. Advise some peers on their own crises of faith. William was clearly just trying to get him out of the house as often as he could, and Patrick always saw through it. But still, what did it hurt? Somewhere along the way, it stopped feeling like work. It stopped being an obligation to help his church leader feel like he was making a difference in Patrick's life. At some point, he started showing up without even being asked by William. How's the head? Pastor William asked him one night when they were cleaning up the soup kitchen. The two of them were scraping the pots of chicken and rice out, hoping to pick away the bits of rice that had cooked onto the side. It's great as long as I quit hitting it on things. I can't remember my driver's license number, but I'm pretty sure I never knew it to begin with. So no great loss, then? Well, I was hoping that if I shook everything up there around long enough, maybe it would find some new info. William laughed at that. I think that's the opposite of how it works. Patrick just shook his head as he rinsed another pot. Maybe if they had a saying about it, William continued. Like, when God closes a door, he opens a window. Have you heard that one? I'm pretty sure everyone's heard that one. William nodded. Probably something to it, then. A few days later, he retired as pastor of the church. And that led Patrick to that moment, behind that curtain, waiting to step out for his first day as the new pastor. He looked at the clock. It was finally time. He reached out to the curtain and gently probed until he found its edge. He had stepped out onto the ice hundreds of times in his life, but he was suddenly terrified of getting tangled up in a curtain. He imagined it seemingly tying itself around him as he would flail against it. He'd fall. He'd bring the whole curtain down. He'd probably pull the roof right off the church and doom them all. He pushed it aside and emerged successfully. The parishioners gradually stopped talking to each other, straightened themselves up, and put all eyes on him. Okay, Patrick thought, unsure how to meet all their gazes at once. Much more like opponents than teammates after all. Except these opponents are playing with a dozen pucks. 
He cleared his throat as he approached the microphone. Thank you all for coming out this morning. I hope many of you recognize me. I'm the new pastor, Pastor Patrick. He winced as he said that. Nope, don't like that. Just call me Patrick. A fair few of the attendees laughed. Almost all of them smiled at him. Patrick felt his knees unlock and the imaginary pucks vanish. His body suddenly did not seem to weigh a thousand pounds. I want to start off today talking about obstacles. Obstacles can really interfere with where you think life is going to take you. He nodded, then looked down at the podium. This time, he smiled. And it turns out I know a thing or two about interference. Absolutely bonkers. These people are great. Agreed. We thoroughly recommend you check out all of the guests that you've just heard. Follow them online, read their stuff. All in all, celebrate talent. As always, make sure you're subscribed to The Bookcase on your chosen podcast listening app or service. And we'll see you next week for part two of the season three finale. Very nice. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you like this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates. Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The Tiny Bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ulala la la Alger Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?